All right, what's up, everybody? We're back. Another quarantine week. <laughs> <laughs> we've, been, we've been safe at home for eight weeks now, see? Oh, man, it's been a long time. It's been a long time. You know, you, uh, we, we have a very special guest today, but I might say that you currently are the toast of the town after that, you know, that picture of you just jacked out of your mind, leaked oh, all over man. the internet, <laughs> man. I, I wish I would have known that was going to be the picture because I would have got a haircut. Like, I, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> hey, hey, I got to, as we welcome in our guest, Adrian Wojnarowski, the best newsbreaker in the NBA. You guys know him as Woj. Uh, Woj, I, did you see the picture of CeCe going around the Twitter sphere today <laughs> of his new physique? It did. I, I, I thought maybe it was CeCe's head superimposed on your body, right? I thought maybe we're like quarantine dizzy here and we need to get the full picture. But if you tell me that was CeCe, I'll believe it. Oh, man. Yeah, I'm locked in right now, man. I've been doing this. Uh, no soy, no gluten, just working out every day. So, you know, we'll see what happens. Yeah, I've, I have not seen similar results from my Peloton, but I'll keep pedaling. I'll keep pedaling. That's right. Right, you got the Peloton too, though. I do, man. It's right. Hey, it's right behind me. It's right there. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, I got the setup right there. How great is the Peloton, Woj? Well, I, it's like I, I feel it's like a cliche now talking about the thing, but for me, it's been <laughs> it's been great. And uh, it's funny. I can't tell you how many conversations I have with like GMs or player uh, agents. I wouldn't say players so much. Yeah. Uh, guys who just text about. Like, what ride did you take? Nothing about the league. <laughs> Nothing about what, what What are you hearing? It was, hey, I took the 40, and I took the 45 minute with uh, um, Emma today. So there's, there's a lot of that going around. I honestly think they're going to start putting them in facilities after this. Like, after this quarantine and everybody being home and so many guys having it, they're going to they're gonna want Pelotons at yeah. the stadiums and practice facilities all over, and, and all over sports watch. Yeah. Hey, listen, more and more, like, I'll take, you know, you do like the instructor ride and, and then I'll do like the 10 or 15 minute across, like through some city. So actually I felt like I got out of my house. I'm riding my bike through <laughs> like uh, Paris or some somewhere, you um, know, it's like small, small victories. You know, yeah. You know, what's funny about that, Woj? I didn't even realize that that was an option. And the other day my sister was like, yeah, you know, you could like ride through Rome and just do a ride yeah, like that. I was like, that's right. no, I like now you need that now. Yeah. You know? Like yeah. <laughs> you, you really like, this is the time for it. Maybe you see, maybe like Peloton is like the finishing touch to the masterpiece you're creating with yourself. It's just yeah, like, man, I, I might have to hop on now. I hear everybody talking about it. Uh, that's well, good. We're we're so excited for this man because um, you know you're a great dude. You're the Michael Jordan of what you do, and we uh, you know you know obviously how big an NBA guy I am. You know with calling games or just being a fan of the league. But I don't know if you know or not. But C is an enormous NBA fan. Yeah. So this is this is great for us to have well, you here, man. Well, first of all, I'm honored to be here with both you guys, and mm. I know CC is a big basketball fan because he may. He may not remember. I'm sure he doesn't remember this, but when his, I guess his son, so I have a son who's 17 and I think CC must have a son who's around that age. Cause they used to yeah. play um, travel basketball in the same sort of circuit. And so my son's team used to play CC's son's team a lot. In fact, wow. CC, did your son, when he was, I'm going to guess, I don't know what grade they were in fourth or fifth grade. Did he have like maybe a Mohawk going for a little time? Yeah, he did. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. In fifth so, grade, yeah, he had like the Mohawk going. He yeah. did. And so my son was bigger. Uh, he was bigger at a younger age. He grew a little faster than others. So he played a lot of center. And uh, he and CeCe's son, you know what? They, they played some games against each other. But I'll tell you this. I can't tell you it was funny how many kids – and even some friends of ours, uh, the Lachlans, I remember their son Brady, who was a big Yankee fan, still is a big Yankee fan. I, I, he would go over during the timeouts. I can still see him. And, like, you know, there'd be a timeout in the game, and he was the little brother. And he would go over and grab the ball and start shooting, and you could see him looking out of the corner of his eye. Did CC see that shot? Did he see that shot? Going? And, and CC was so great to those kids because he, he gets it. I know he gets it all the time. And every single kid at every one of those Saturday morning, 8 a.m., 9 a.m., whatever it was, like every single time CC was great to every kid who'd come up to him. And, and, uh, so that's, that's a great memory I have of CC in basketball. Oh, thank you, man. Yeah. That, that's crazy. That, that must've been that 60 elite team that they had. It was like a bunch yeah. of kids from Jersey and they, we played all over yeah, and stuff. That's so right. yep. it was always well, like right at the end of, uh, the off season for me, we would drive down to, uh, Maryland and, 
you know, have a tournament. So I just, I miss those days, man. That, yeah, that AAU yeah, a lot circuit. of fun. It was fun. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that is great. You know what? And there's another way that you guys are connected, which I don't even know if you know this, but um, see, we talk a lot about you with the Boys and Girls Club and mm-hmm. how important the Boys and Girls Club was to you growing up, how important it is to you giving back. And we know what you've been doing uh, during COVID-19, delivering meals uh, in the different boroughs. And Woj, I know you have been doing these wonderful, I, I guess, interviews uh, yeah. where you're, you're I, I think you have about, what, 3,000 members of the Boys and Girls Club, you know, at, in these different sessions, watching these interviews that you've been doing with different celebrities during this period of time. And I know how much the Boys and Girls Club mean to you as well. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. It's been, uh, it's been a lot of fun. We had, uh, the idea started with, uh, you know, I grew up in Bristol, Connecticut, right down the street from ESPN. And uh, you know, I work with the Bristol Boys and Girls Club there that I um, was in as a kid. And it's a lot of friends of mine that I grew up with are now on the board there. And, you know, if I can help with events there or with fundraising, I've tried to do that. And so when all of this started and the Boys and Girls Club closed and I was talking to the, to the, the people in Bristol wondering how I could help. And it was like, yeah, we could, I could make a donation and, and, and we could do that. But what more could we do to start bringing, uh, you know, for so many kids – when those doors are shut, uh, for a lot of kids, that three or four hours a day or one hour a day that they get out of their house, that they get to the club, it serves so many purposes. Mm-hmm. And to try to think of a way that we could um, uh, kind of get into their homes a little bit and, and let them know people are still thinking about them. And, and so we started with, uh, it's funny, I started with, well, maybe we could just do something virtual for the Bristol Boys and Girls Club. And I'm like, well, if I can get guests on for the Bristol kids, why can't we do it for a bigger audience? So we've been kind of moving around the country, different markets with, with kind of uh, individuals and in their markets who um, would resonate with kids. We had Donovan Mitchell in the, for the Connecticut Boys and Girls Clubs. He was a, a, a product of the Greenwich Club. And we had Eric Spolstra uh, in Miami, along with in the Florida Boys and Girls Clubs. And, and Maria Taylor joined in on that. And we have Trey Young and Shanae Bumike coming on uh, Wednesday night for like Texas and Oklahoma and, and Atlanta, some places where uh, both Shanae and Trey really resonate. And and then we put them online. We put them on our YouTube page on ESPN. And, you know, if nothing else, certainly it's like kind of reaching out, letting the kids be able to ask some questions and, and feel like they can connect one-on-one with those guys, but also just bringing attention to the fact that the boys and girls clubs are out there. They're still serving their communities. And like a lot of institutions like that in this country, you know, they're in dire need of funding and and of help to try to continue going that hopefully their doors will reopen. And uh, I know there's lots of places people can donate their money. And I know everybody's trying to be as generous as they can, but I wanted to, you know, try to play some small role in making sure people recognize that the boys and girls clubs are, are still serving the kids and people in their communities. And so it's been a lot of fun. I've really enjoyed it. The, the one last week with Spo and Maria Taylor, Spo took it over. He started asking Maria <laughs> questions. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> That's great, man. That's uh, awesome. And But like the, the Boys and Girls Club means so much to so many kids. And like you said, that hour or four hours or however long you get to go to the club is like something special. So every time we go to the club and the kids are picking up the food on Wednesdays, that's the first thing they ask is when the club is coming back open because they miss it so much. So um, to be able to virtually, you know, get into their homes and help them out. I mean, that's awesome. I love that. And I love that you guys are connected that way. I also am fascinated by the lighting situation with CeCe's yeah, closet. Nah, it's my because, closet. Yeah, it's just great. So, Adrian, what we've been doing is CeCe has been – and by the way, if you have news you got to take care of, go no, for it. No, I yeah. don't. In fact, it's like I look like I'm like – like well, Cece's is lighting up. Mine looks like yeah. I got like sun ray like, yeah. light coming in. <laughs> you're, like you're in a, like, like I've got room. the tablet or something. Yeah, like exactly. I'm like like Moses on the mountain is sending down <laughs> word to me about something here. Yeah, exactly. Meanwhile, then Cece was in the dark because he's been switching up his look every week. So today to we're in his out. closet. Yeah. But it's on a timer. The light's on a timer, so like it just goes off. So like I'm gonna I'm get up every every five minutes to, to turn it back on. It's a great thing about a podcast is the casual nature. <laughs> um, it, you know, Woj. As far as um, the NBA goes, as we sit, you know, today, and uh, we're recording Tuesday night. We'll release this Thursday morning. Who knows if any you know Woj bombs happen between now and then? But as we sit Tuesday night, uh, May twelfth. 
um, you know, what right now uh, is, I guess, the, the, the biggest barrier to getting basketball back and resuming this season? It's a good question, Ryan. I, I think probably the biggest barrier is going to be um, the the issue of safety. And is it safe? Uh, I don't think there's a shortage of want to. I think the league wants to play. I think the players in the right circumstances want to play. And I know everybody wants a universal yes or no, but it's yes is in context of is it safe? Um, is it um, how much risk am I taking? And I think that's the question that's going to come up for everybody. There are going to be different levels of risk involved in this. There are going to be players in their 20s, early 30s who don't have any underlying conditions, who are healthy, who might be taking less risk than a player who's had um, some medical issues or a head coach in a league who's 70 years old or 68 mm-hmm. years old. There's going to be different levels of risk for everybody, and that's going to continue forward beyond this summer. Um, we're going to be dealing with this virus for um, certainly into next season. I don't think there's any question about that. And so, uh, but I do think that their sides are motivated to play. And, you know, Adam Silver started to lay out, uh, you know, we've done it in reporting, but then Adam Silver on that call Friday with the Players Association started to lay out some more specifics and and from his his mouth about a one or two site, um, you know, bubble, he didn't use the word bubble, but one or two site uh, situation said, I don't want you guys, there's, there's no point in having you guys flying across the country, flying back and forth at this point, no fans. Um, and so, you know, you start to dig down in this, no decision needs to be made in May. You know, I think the league is ready. You know, I think at some point in June, they're going to have to decide to open up the camps. And, and I think it'd be, it will be at least a three week training camp to start. I, I don't think it would be less than that. He, he said three to six weeks. I don't think it'd be as long as six weeks, but a three to six, three week camp minimum. And then what does it look like? Is it right into the playoffs? Is it a play in tournament where you can get more teams who are out of the playoff hunt, motivated, incentivized to jump in this and, and, and take the games more seriously? Because right now you have one through eight in each conference is pretty much set. I don't think the ninth team is catching the eighth seed with the amount of games that they would be able to play. Mm-hmm. And you're going to have to incentivize those teams to If you're Washington, why would you play Bradley Beal? Or if you're Portland, why would you play Lillard and McCollum very much <clears throat> off a short training camp? Here's what teams don't want to do. They don't want to get guys injured in a tight training camp and have it impact their off season or impact yeah. the start of next year. And so lots of variables. Um, I, I would never say for sure that it's going to happen, but I, I do think there's a level of optimism that they can get there on this in this off season, but it changes quickly. The virus changes. We'll see what this country looks like in a few weeks and uh, what the virus, where it is, how it's operating, how opening up these, you know, different regions of the country is going to impact. If you listen to the scientists and the doctors, it's going to have a negative impact on a spike in, in uh, uh, infections and, that's all going to be part of the equation. It's no way they go straight into the playoffs, right, after, after training camp? Like if, if, they, if I, they did a three-week training camp and just had the playoff teams ready to, to go? See, see, I, I, I wouldn't say no way, but I don't think it's the preferred choice because here's another factor. Those regional sports network deals that teams have, uh, it, kind of a magic number for teams to get their full money. Or, or more of their money in, in certain cases, is to play 70 games. So a team like Atlanta, I think, is three games away. Other teams who played maybe more national TV games might be further away on it. Uh, but, but it does impact the financial bottom line. It's, that's not the entire motivation to do it, but it's a motivation. Again, I think they're still working through those scenarios. Like I know people have discussed, what if you just took the seven, like, like a play-in tournament for seven to 12, now you go all the way down to the 12th seed and you tell the rest of the teams, let's say the Clevelands, the uh, Golden States, you guys could stay home. I don't know if there's an appetite to not bring every team back. And then how do you share the money? How do you share the pie financially? Complex issue. Uh, I, I think that it's going to be, you know, this is a conversation just like baseball, like the NFL Players Association, 
the league office and obviously the organizations themselves. You know what I think is so interesting um, with this particular topic, Adrian, is like, you know, we all deal in varying degrees of insider knowledge at different times, right? Uh, none more so than you, Woj, with, <laughs> with the knowledge you have. Uh, and and see, you know, you and I both see m- many times where we know things maybe we can't share, maybe we can, but that other people don't know or isn't out there yet, right? And what's so interesting about this is, like, I'm sure, Woj, you get people who are saying, like, Okay, you know, like just like I asked you, but even more definitively, all right, you know, tell me exactly when it's coming back. And it's like, you know, you all you know is like pieces of the equation, right? There's no one, Adam Silver, no one, our top doctors, nobody really has a feel for right. exactly when it would be, right? That's right. And it's funny. This is, you're, you're right about that. Sometimes you know things that you can't report yet or you can't yeah. fully report yet. I promise you, I don't know. And, <laughs> and God bless anybody who does think they know. Yeah, I don't yeah. know that Adam Silver knows. It's funny how you'll have conversations, and this is conversations with people who are kind of very involved with the return to play process and who are consulting and being consulted by the league and the Players Association. And they're all involved in it. And I could talk to one of them at 2 o'clock and be convinced, yeah, I think they're going to play. And I could talk to another guy at 3 o'clock. And, th- I mean, this happens, and you go, I don't think so. You know, like, and people interpret the information differently. They, you know, everyone is, again, you are projecting out a month, two months, five months, eight months in in ways that, you know, you're trying to evaluate, interpret the information. You're listening to different experts and nobody knows. And I think, but more than even the resumption of this season, guys, I think I sense a much more concern about what next season would look like. The NBA could survive. It's not, the NBA could survive canceling the rest of the season. That doesn't mean that's what they want to do. It doesn't mean it's the best scenario, but they played 75% of their season. It's not like baseball that hasn't played a game yet. And now you're talking about, if you lost this season, how many months is that before you start another one? 18 months without your sport? Mm. That that is, uh, I, I think there might be more at stake when you haven't started. But I do sense much more concern about next season and what that looks like and the fear of not being able to have fans in arenas and what that would do to the revenue structure. Even if they push the start of next season back until Christmas, late December, which they're very serious about doing and I think has more, uh, growing support, even if they did cancel the season, or excuse me, even if they did cancel the season and, and it, not starting it in mid-October because it buys you more time to have more dates of the year where you could have a uh, fans and stands in, in the mm. stands and economically, how does the league operate with uh, a system of 50, 50, a 50, 50 revenue share essentially when the gate revenues just end or there's only certain teams that have them. Some don't. And so much of the NBA is built around revenue sharing teams like Indiana or Memphis or Charlotte who might be getting upwards of 20 million plus a year from big market teams Well, there's no revenue to share. And so it throws everything off. And I think that's a a greater concern right now is what next year looks like, Um, which doesn't mean they're not grinding away at trying to get this year done. But there's short term and there's a lot of long term concerns about what this means for for the league. Pushing the season back to me seems like the the right call just to start in December. Um, I mean, for me. As a basketball fan anyway, I mean, you know, having more basketball during the summer would, I mean, suck as a baseball fan too, but, <laughs> but you know, the NBA would run the summer if they moved the season back to December and had the, the playoffs and everything run through August. And then that's when, be, that's when the baseball season really heats up anyway. So it just makes more sense to me to kind of start the season later. How do you feel about that? No, How do you think I, players I, feel about like not having the summer anymore? Yeah, CC, there's no question. And it's been a conversation that has gone on in the league. Uh, Steve Coonan, who's the president of the Atlanta Hawks, has for several years been pushing this idea of, of adjusting the calendar that way. Let's go head to head against baseball versus going head to head against the NFL. Try to take the summer on. Um, it would change the calendar for those in the league. There's no question. And I, I thought it had modest support before the pandemic i think now it makes more sense now it may end up happening by it may happen out of necessity Mm -hmm. and instead of experimenting with it it's like well we're going to see what it looks like for real see how we feel about it 
But once you get on that schedule, you do it for a year. It's hard to get back. How do you get back? Right. Let, right. How, how do you, do you get, get back, back next year in the schedule? How do you right. get back to training camp? How do you start training camp in September if your season's ending in August and you have a draft and then you have free agency? And then you're going to do summer league, which would become like fall baseball league, right? It'd be that yeah. time of year. Now you're kind of on that calendar, especially if you're not willing to shorten the season, if you still want to play 82 games and play a full playoffs. So that kind of gets you on that track. Uh, but I think we may find out because of where we are um, with the pandemic that, that we'll see how people like it. It, it, it may happen. That's one of the interesting things um, just about going through this for sports is like you're being forced into actualizing your creative choices, right? Like so even a sport like baseball, see, where like, hey, you know, expanded playoffs and you know, people are resistant to change and, hey, we don't want to see seven inning doubleheaders or what. Well, hey, you may have to. Yeah. And then maybe it gets implemented that way. You know, same thing with the schedule here with the NBA, like. You know, oh, could Christmas be a good idea? We know there's been some support for it. Like, well, guess what? We're going to have to try it. Like, so. <laughs> That's right. And, and I think what it's doing is, listen, our expectations of what we're used to, what we're comfortable with, are changing in every phase of our life. Mm -hmm. Like, none of us want our kids to be having to go to school online, but that's the reality right now. So let's make the best of it. How do we make this work? It isn't ideal. But it's the reality. Um, we're limited in how we move around. And I, all of us take for granted less just taking a walk around your block, taking a walk around the neighborhood. Like, yeah, you would just take that for granted. You, you don't. And and so how we look at sports where people say, well, I can't imagine the games without fans. Well, you better start to imagine the games without <laughs> yeah. fans because th then there won't be any. And so it's just not going to be what we're. Uh, used to, and I, I don't know how long this is going to last. If this is some of it may become permanent, some of it is temporary or a couple of years. I mean, I'm the last guy to know, but I think when it comes to, like you said, seven inning double header, um, you know, um, <laughs> I was watching SVP last night and he had a line that just made me laugh. He was talking about, I think the, the, the proposal is the NL is not going to have the DH, right? Yeah. And he said, like, right, no DH it. in the NL. And he's like, Hey, hey, pure. It's a pandemic. Like before you like say something, it, was, it just made me laugh. Um, so I, I just think like that's going to be the least of our concerns um, in the world right now. And and the, the the teams, the organizations, that league, the leagues that embrace like it's listen. This isn't going to be what you imagined. It's not going to be what you want. And everyone's going to be pissed off and say, "Well, this isn't fair." Like I'm already hearing it from teams who are in the playoffs going, wait, why do I have to play a play-in series? Like, hey, if you're Dallas and Memphis in the, in the West, you have, like, considerably outplayed everybody from yeah. nine and down. Like, yeah. Dallas is way ahead. I don't know how many games it is, but, but a bunch of games ahead. And Dallas yeah. could win two games in a row and be in, like, fourth place. But the one thing Adam Silver in the NBA is going to keep saying and has said is you've got to get in the mindset of thinking about what's best for the league. And I think in general, in the conversations I have with people, they are. I, I don't sense as much competitive and competitive balance, how that impacts me. Mm. Everybody knows, like the owners, the general managers, the agents, players in general, everybody gets, they're fortunate to make a living in this business. They're fortunate to, to be a part of it. All of us are to, for me to do this for a living. And you, you've got to look a little bit at what the greater good is because like if anybody ever took this for granted and was like, hey, I'm entitled to this and we're owed all this, like these last months have reminded everybody we're not entitled or owed anything and it's all very fragile. Yeah, I, I think you're right though with the, the fact that baseball being in a little more trouble because they haven't started yet. So it's hard to, you know, to even think about not having a season. Like you said, there's 18 months without – having a season and now it just seems like, you know, it might be like some collective bargaining things that get in the way of it, man. That, I mean, it's going to be crazy. It's going to be crazy to see how this all plays out, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. It, it feels like, uh, you know, the NBA would be better positioned, you know, than anyone else, right. To be able to punt to next year because you got in such a huge chunk of your season, if you had mm -hmm. to, um, Woj on the, uh, you know, uh, just one more thing on like the resumption of play stuff. 
it, you know, we've heard about a bubble in Vegas. You know, I don't know. Bubble is maybe not the 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 actual official terminology, but it's at least the word we're all using, right? Or we've heard about like, oh, a bubble in at Disney World in Orlando. Is there any more traction to one location than the other at this moment for if they're going to resume and? You know, and, and just the other thing on that would be, is there any date in which the NBA has said, like, look, we can't restart the season this late? Like, it has to be by August or one or, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I think the drop-dead dates are based on what kind of limited – I think they've got schedules yeah. prepared for, like, how many days do we have to work with? And so knowing how many days you might have to work with, then – like you would maybe perhaps you would like to have a seven game series in each series and playoff series, but maybe you go, well, we can't do that. We're going to have to do best of five, uh, you know, maybe best of five in the first round, whatever. Uh, I, you know, Adam Silver said, and he has said he imagined one, to, one or two sites. And so that could keep both Vegas and Orlando in play. They could use practice facilities a later in series. Um, you know, they told teams to get, to, to give them a sense of their practice facilities and how they could work on TV angles in there and maybe do it with uh, whether it's announcers in there, remote announcers, remote cameras, all these options. Um, and I think uh, the one thing that Silver was clear on when he talked to the players on Friday and I heard the tape of it was that I, he just said, I don't want you guys to, two things he said that jumped out at me in terms of what the player experience might be. I don't want you guys fly. I don't want to have to be flying you guys around during this. There's no point in it. It doesn't seem to make sense that you'd be essentially in one place. But I also don't imagine a scenario where you're just in your hotel room. You're in a hotel room the whole time when you're not playing. That's mm -hmm. not also not what we imagine. Uh, that's interesting. I'm curious to see how this is all going to break down, man, in the in the days and weeks to come. Um, you, you you know from for just sort of like NBA news stuff, Woj, you know, people wonder like, okay, would KD and Kyrie be back? And, you know, would they play if the season was to resume? Um, you know, being around the Nets, I know it had seemed like KD was at least physically close, you know, when, when everything got halted, but there was no incentive to bring him back at that point with Kyrie hurt. Um, you know, people have been so focused on KD, uh, I know I think you said the other day, like, look, that's not that's not in the Nets' plans. But is Kyrie even ready to be back from his shoulder surgery anyway? Or, or do we know anything about whether or not he would even be back, Woj? I don't have any sense, Ryan, that Kyrie would return either. And, um, you know, I think it, 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 the, the risk is obviously shortened training camp. Guys have been working out at different rates. I think the inclination for all these teams is going to be to protect, especially those who aren't the Lakers or aren't the Clippers or aren't the Bucks. You know, that there's a few handful of teams who think, hey, we could maybe win it. And, I, and the list is longer than that. Boston, Philly, you know, a Denver, Utah, puncher's chance, right, to, yeah. to maybe get in the playoffs. I'm not saying they're favorites, but – uh, the Rockets, obviously. Miami, maybe, yeah. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah. And, and listen, with Kyrie and KD, they can beat anybody. There's no question. But I, I don't – I have not sensed any appetite from the Nets to want to play those two in a shortened season, certainly KD. And um, I'm not exactly clear where Kyrie is in his rehab, um, but I do think that he's, um, you know, a part of a bigger plan in Brooklyn – to try, I think try to come back at full strength next season and believe this is our chance now to be a, a, a championship contender, come back healthy, have those guys ready, and then go at it with a full training camp, a full off season, not trying to jam something into a very tight window here. They have these, they have both these players under contract for four years. If I think if, if it didn't go two months, like Katie, right at the end, right at the end before, the shutdown, he looked ready. He did. So I think if this goes two weeks and they keep the facilities open and everything, that then you may yeah. you might have saw him. You and, know what and, I'm saying? And, and but it, that's right, CC. And I don't know that KD, I'm not so sure that KD's been able to have access to the same workout regimen that he had yeah. when he was rehabbing. And that like that's a that's an important part of this. And again, to put yourself like no one's really had the same some people have had better situations than others to keep working, 
but no one's had optimum conditions to keep working. And I think coming off the injury KD is coming off of and all the variables, you want optimum for, for Kevin Durant and, and Kyrie Irving, not, not some makeshift thing that you're trying to piece together and then throw uh, maybe the best player in the league back out there. You know, Woj, we uh, we obviously it's a podcast, right? So we always love we love storytelling and and everything. And and you, you know, you constantly, um, I'm sure, are privy to stories and obviously writing them, breaking news, whatever. Who who are some of the characters throughout your time covering the NBA who you just feel like have been the most interesting or have produced some of the most interesting stories that you've come across, whether they're still you know around the game today or not? I mean. It- been a lot. I mean, I've been the league. NBA is a the NBA is a great league to cover in that it is full of like, and and when I say characters, I mean like just interesting people and mm-hmm. from lots of different walks of life. I mean, I you know I think about Kobe a lot, and and Kobe was as as interesting of a guy of a player that I covered. He was a smart. He wasn't just smart about his own craft, and he truly saw it as a craft. He was really interested in what you did, how you did it, how you viewed it as a craft. Um, it, that was always interesting with Kobe. I always felt sometimes he knew more about my industry uh, than I did, and he he really studied all of it and gave it lots of thought and and thought about how he fit. Uh, into it. I mean, I used to tease him all the time. <laughs> I would say he was like very late to Twitter, and <laughs> and I, he might have went to Instagram first. And I was I was often the beneficiary of him when he had something to say. There was a stretch of years where I could, you know, Kobe did a lot for my career in that way that he gave me credibility covering the NBA when I was just new as a national writer because he would talk to me and I could get him going on stuff that was going on. Yeah. And so I remember I would say to him like, Hey Kobe, Twitter's Twitter's not for you. Like, <laughs> Twitter, Twitter's small talk. You're you're not a small talk guy, Kobe. Like you're you're about proclamations. Keep making those proclamations with me. Yeah. But I knew I knew that the minute he got on there, like he would need all of us a lot less and and I would and I would laugh and say like he knew exactly what I was saying. And um but I remember those and he finally got on the social media and I said, This is gonna be trouble for all of us who who needed to be the filter for him. So uh, I think about some of um those things. But you know how competitive and you saw it with Michael Jordan's eulogy at Kobe's memorial service and yeah. how emotional Michael got about it. And and I think back, this was the year after the Lakers had won the back-to-back title. So let's see, this was 2010 or 11, maybe 11. They had won 09 and 10, right? Is that right? And yeah, they, they won 09 and season. 10, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and uh, he was at a point, he had this, and Michael kind of talked about it. And I think Kobe... I think had some somewhat their relationship wasn't always like, you know, he'd call him big brother. And, but like there were times where they weren't like necessarily communicating that well. Mm. And that was a stretch. And I remember meeting Kobe in Minneapolis for dinner. He wanted to sit down and talk and I was going to write, I was at Yahoo then. And um, we sit down and it was right after Michael had given some, I have to go back and look it up. Michael had given some list. I don't know if it was top three or top five of either maybe all-time players or current players. Whatever the list was, he didn't include Kobe on it. Mm. And (laughs) I know it really um, bothered Kobe, to say the least. And so we sat down to talk, and I don't know if I brought up Michael or something with Michael. Oh, I know what it was because Kobe had gotten to – that was his fifth title. That's what it was. And we were talking about can you catch Michael. Like he was one away. He was one away from Michael. And I think Kobe always felt that will be, you know, like that's how I will separate myself in history. Whatever my shooting percentage was, whatever my PR was, if I catch him in championships, like that's my way to sort of put myself, uh, uh, you know, maybe more shoulder to shoulder with him. He was one away. And so we started talking about Jordan. <laughs> and he says to me, you know, you know, Jordan wasn't the one I learned 
likes. You know, it was Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson's the one who really taught me <laughs> that I emulated. <laughs> and in my mind, I'm going, Michael Jackson, what are you talking about? And so, like, I got my tape recorder on. I'm going, well, like, how did that work? Yeah, yeah. You know, what, what do you, you know? And he went on about how he would go to Michael Jackson's house and watch him record music. He would go to the studio with him and watch how he put songs together, music together, and, and how, mm. how he learned like the attention of, to detail and the process and the hours of every note and you know and he said that's where i learned that from it wasn't mj <laughs> yeah. and so i'm like all right it's like i'll go there with you we're talking i'm following up on it okay and so i get back i remember i go back to my my hotel room and i i hit google or yeah i certainly hit the search on on kobe and michael jackson I'm like i'm saying to myself has he ever talked about this that i just missed this and i searched and i'm like uh, it's not there. He's never talked about this. But my point is what Kobe wanted to do is that was his way of taking a shot back at Michael. <laughs> oh yeah. You're saying I'm not one of the best, whatever the list was. Well, Hey man, I didn't even idolize you anyway, even though he did. And, and, and you know, you know, he did, but that was like the competitive thing back and forth. It was pretty neat. <laughs> oh, that is an awesome story. Oh my gosh. I love that stuff. And you could see, I mean, I mean, we're watching it in the last dance, right? Like you could see the way both those guys had, you know, that kind of uh, streak. You know, Woj, how, I mean, how accessible has Jordan seemed today uh, just in NBA circles to, I don't know if it's whether, I mean, he's an owner of a team, right? So it's got to be hard for other players to get in there, I would think. But uh, I, I'm obviously, this has given him a different level of visibility than he's had in a while, I feel like, in the league. What's your sense of kind of um, his interactions with, with the game today, uh, you know, beyond just Charlotte? Yeah, I mean, you're right. It is on the ownership level, um, at that level in the league. And, and I think the Jordan brand, he's got the players, obviously, who are part of his Jordan brand uh, uh, endorsements. And I think there's certainly some relationships there. Um, but beyond that, I don't know that he's as connected. Kobe was, when Kobe retired and near retirement, Kobe loved that players would start to take pilgrimages to come <laughs> see him. Jason yeah. Tatum would come and spend time with him. Kawhi Leonard would come. And he loved that. I think that uh, he, he likes to teach and he likes people who are serious minded about it. And so guys would go spend time with him. And he opened up in that way later, much later in his career, near the end. And then, and then upon retirement, you know, there would always be guys going down in the gym. And I think he liked what that represented. And I think he liked, there were certain guys who uh, competitively, he just got a kick of, kick out of. And, and saw some of himself and how they went about their business. And, and so uh, more so than maybe Michael, who was a generation removed. Listen, for a lot of young players, players who came in the league and young people, Kobe was their Michael Jordan. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why his law, part of why his loss hit people so hard. To them, he was their MJ. Mm. And, and he worked with those guys. Like, he was their MJ and he would – you know, show you the secrets and show you how to get better and even show you how to get better within your skill set. So, like, you didn't have to, like, emulate what he did. He would show, you know, different ways for you to get better yourself. So, mm -hmm. I think, you know, him being this generation's MJ and willing to work with players made him that popular. That's right. Absolutely. You know, it's funny. You you used the phrase, see, when we talk about Kobe after he passed, of he had hands on these guys, you know, and yeah. – and, and that was so different. Woj, it, it reminds me of something I've always heard about you, which is that you are uh, very passionate about the next generation of reporters and, and wanting to kind of, you know, help them along the way. But I'm wondering, you know, without, um, you know, divulging any, any top secret secrets, like when, when young reporters come to you, and I'm sure they do often, and they say, hey, you know, what, what's some baseline things for me to kind of work off of as a foundation as I want to get into this business? What kind of things do you say to them as they're, you know, looking to forge a path here? Uh, as much as anything, Ryan, is, is work ethic and commitment to it. I, it. It's not that much different than any other. It's not different than your craft, Ryan. It's not different than uh, CC's. There's always a little bit of natural ability that in any given uh, profession you had, you may have been born with, or, or it's in your genes, or it's not in your genes. I, I like it, it, it. You know, I always try to tell young people that 
that work that work ethic is a talent, just like um, your voice, your your apparent. It, it's a talent, and and that especially this profession. And this is listen. There's no. I don't know what the right route is to go anymore in this business. The route that I came, the right, the route that I came up with going small newspaper to a little bigger newspaper. I don't know if that works anymore. The newspapers aren't, the smaller papers don't have, um, there, there's not as many of them. There's not as many of those yeah. jobs available in communities. And for me that worked. Um, but, but I, I just think that I, I tend to try to tell young people, if you can imagine another profession or excuse me, if, if you can imagine doing another job in another profession, you should go do it. If you can't imagine doing anything else, that this is the one for you because mm. it is hard to make your way. And I, I, I don't envy young people coming up in the business right now. It is, it is tightened and it is, I, I think it's harder in some ways to make it. I think there's less good jobs than there used to be, but they're different and they, they show up, they've, uh, they've emerged in different ways, the positions. You can be seen and discovered because of the internet, because of social media. If you do great work, people can see it. When I came up, I would send my newspaper clips, photocopy them and send them to editors all over the country and get either no response or um, a, a form letter back saying um, thanks, but, but no thanks. But you know what kept me going when I was younger? Listen, I worked in Waterbury, Connecticut for four years and I worked in Fresno for two and a half, three years and at the Bergen Record in New Jersey for nine or 10 years and, and all good papers. And the record, uh, CC, it's probably, he might get it at his doorstep yeah. Yeah, for sure. uh, in Bergen <laughs> County. But uh, I, I would say that for me, like no one ever heard of me until, I mean, really the, 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 the cover of the book there, Miracle St. Anthony, a book I did on Bob Hurley Sr. and St. Anthony's in the school. I mean, I was in my um, early thirties and then the book came out and then I went to Yahoo. I was like in my mid thirties before anybody even knew who I was. And uh, like there are no overnight successes. Very few. I don't know how to do it in that way. I know some other people have done it quicker. I'm, I'm for me, the path I took, um, worked for me that I, um, just kind of, uh, kept grinding away at it over a very long time. But I, I think more than ever, you know, this is a business that rewards tenacity, that rewards staying with it. And, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, but, but I see so much great young talent out there and I see so many, and, and I wish, and one of the things I've done since I went back to ESPN, I, I said, I grew up in Bristol, Connecticut and, um, started a writing initiative at my, uh, alma mater, Bristol Central High School. And, and my, my high school English teacher who got me interested in writing and who gave me, um, showed belief in me and told me that maybe like gave me confidence when I really needed confidence. Um, you know, I grew up in a family, my dad worked in a factory. I, nobody else in my family had gone to college. It wasn't like a, a normal track mm. in, in my house. And so uh, she gave me great confidence. And so we can do that with some of the younger people there. And, uh, and even like we have kids who are going to, who are science students and we do, you know, writing in the science system because you're going to need it in whatever you do. And so that's been a lot of fun to be a part of that and see the kids, their summer programs that we can send them to scholarships with college and, and then work on their college essays, lots of different, um, to me, that's a lot of fun. And just if we can reach out to more young people who might not have access to, um, Hey, not everyone's going to Syracuse journalism school. Not everybody's right. going to go to Columbia or Northwestern. And it's great if you can do that, but there's so much talent and potential in our cities and in our rural areas and lots of places that I just hope that we're reaching out there and, and showing a way because we need so many in, in whatever area of whatever discipline of journalism it is, in whatever area, we need people from lots of different backgrounds and lots of different perspectives to shape the news. It can't just be one kind of people. Mm. It can't just be um, those who got to go to a certain kind of school going up and uh, growing up and, and had, had, had had access to things that other kids don't have access to. So like for me, that's more than somebody trying to cover the NBA or do what I do. I mean, I've been really lucky, uh, really lucky. And there's, um, I never imagined having the job that I have. I just like growing up in Connecticut, if I could have just gotten, I was an intern at the Hartford Current through high school and college. 
And like my dream was to cover the University of Hartford basketball beat. Like that's what I thought would be, it would yeah. be great. And so like for me to uh, like what, what excites me more is trying to make sure that we can give more kids, more young people encouragement and the tools they need to be able um, to, to do this, not just be a sports writer or a sportscaster, but like more than ever, we need, we need people to cover city hall. We need people to cover local news. Mm. Like we need, like th there still is no greater um, check on power in this country and in any democracy than to have great journalism at every level of government and in communities and storytelling. And I mean, we need that more than ever. And so I, I hope that, um, um, you know, I hope that, that, that all of us who are in the business can, can play a part in trying to keep that train moving. Man, that's so well said, Woj, and that strikes home for me because it's one of my greatest frustrations, uh, you know, with consuming news at different times and, and media and, and uh, you know, just people being, you know, so uh, constricted by short form that, you know, you don't, you're not allowed to get into the gray. And as you say that, I, I, it just it makes me think um, about like you're a great writer. And yet you constantly also have to access social media, right? And you got to break news that way. That's got to be a difficult balancing act for you just because I know there's got to be times where you're like, <laughs> and I know a lot of times your news is linked to your writing and everything, but I'm sure there's times where you want to write out all the different gray area. And instead it's like, well, for time's sake, I just got to get this out here and not yeah. explain more. That's got to be a tough kind of thing to wrestle with at times in today's journalism, right? It's, it's a balancing act because uh, it is important to be first and it's important to get news out, but you've got to provide context and you've got to be able to, and, and I feel like we do a good balance. Sometimes a, a story might begin with a new, a, a tweet, here's the news. And then in a couple hours, there's a thousand words explaining um, what it means and a deeper reporting of it. But uh, it's a push and pull. I, I've had so many different incarnations of my career. I was a general columnist at the Bergen record. Like when I came up in newspapers, that was the big job. You wanted to be, um, you know, Dave Anderson at the New York times, another yeah. Bergen County, another yeah. Bergen County legend. Uh, you know, Ian O'Connor, who I work with at ESPN now was a great idol of mine. Mark Kriegel, like they were the stars of newspapers and um, like you got to go to the world series, you got to go to the Super Bowl, you did it. And then as time went on, everything started to move towards specialization. And that's when I moved to the NBA when it felt like specialization might be a better track um, in, in the digital age. And, and that was the one I went on. So I've done the job in lots of different ways through the years. This is how I'm doing it now. Um, but, but certainly all of it helps you, all of the training you've had. I mean, I always say the hardest thing to do in this business, the hardest thing I'll ever do, it is not free agency. It is not covering uh, a shutdown. It's not game seven of the NBA finals. Man, it's a high school football game on Friday night in Turin. <laughs> if you can, I tell young people, if you can figure out how to, like, figure out, like, there's, like, three players with number 44, right? They got the same kids, JV, JV kids up on varsity, but they put them in the game. You're going, wait a minute. I thought that was – wait, which guy just ran with the ball? Because there's two 44s. Like, and then you're in the mud on the sidelines, and you're taking notes, and it's raining, and now your notes – and then – team gets blown out. The coach is pissed off. He just gets on the bus. You've got to learn to think on your feet. Like I've got to get that coach off the bus and get him to answer my questions. Like, come on, man, you got to get off the bus. The quarterback 16, he doesn't have much to say, but you got to get something out of him. Like, and then like, I got to go write the story. I'm on deadline. You're in the AD's office or you're in the press box and they shut the lights out. And then you're at a 7-Eleven on a payphone, which you guys are both old enough to know what that even means. Yeah, yeah. Right? And, and so, like, you're calling the office, reading the story. In a, like, if you can do that, man, you, you can cover, you know, you can cover free agency. Like, you can't. It, nice. It's funny because it, it, it reminds me just of, like, a random college football game. Like, every now and again, even to this day, like, I might, ESPN might ask me, like, hey, can you do, like, Toledo against, like, Dayton or something like that? And I'm like, I, like, look at the schedule and I'm like, okay, am I available? And then do I want to have seven days of ridiculous, laborious prep? Because this is going to be tougher to prep for than anything else I do the rest of the year, right? Like when people ask about prep for, 
you know, NBA or Yankees or Nets or whatever. Yeah, I put in a ton of time, but all the information is right there for you. So it's it, it's yeah, not, yeah. you know, it's like when you're trying to figure out, you know, right, high school players or random colleges or it's like, man, that stuff is is tough. It's it's just hard to weed through and figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. And I just think at that level, you learn to deal. You learn there's an art to be. Listen, it is not easy to walk into a major league clubhouse and just go up and start talking to CC Sabathia. Like you've got to know how to approach people. You got to know how to be able to talk when you're when your tape recorder's not out and your notebook's yeah. not there. And that build a trust that what they're what you're that that you're not there to burn them or to get them to slip up and say something in a conversation that you're gonna run to report like like and it takes a long time to to build that trust and I understand from a player's point of view um I there was somebody who came to manage in New York and I, I'm trying to remember who it was and he said I can't remember what but he said somebody warned him like you gotta be careful of the faceless masses and it's all <laughs> the guys you don't know and and there are lots of people you know jammed in there and so like to me I learned that covering you know, a nothing, nothing girl soccer game with this like light snow in Waterbury in like early November going nothing, nothing girl soccer game in the wind. How am I right? But like, that's where you're challenged and you learn. And again, it's a craft and you get better and better at it. And, um, like I, I admire that, that those who, who kind of had in any profession, I mean, most of us have stories like that everywhere. It's, it hasn't always been easy but i always tell young people more than anything else i think and and i bet you this is true for cc and it's true for you ryan when you think of the people you were coming up with who you thought were so much better than you i don't know how i can compete with this guy or or this woman whoever it was Mm -hmm. that in the end i i never felt i was the most talented at anything but those who've made it in my profession that i think of the common denominator it was they they outwork people and they were willing to accept rejection, being told no a million times, and to not lose your confidence, and to keep sort of trying to come back at it and stay with it, and and I think, in in any of our professions, that belief in you, and then having, we all know those people around us who encouraged us, and uh, had belief in us that that was enough to fuel us to keep us going. Just a random comment someone yeah. would make to you, and you think like they didn't think twice about saying, "Hey, you're pretty good." You got a chance. And, and I try when I'm, when I see that talent in young people that, that, if, that, that I want to share that with them because it's, especially in this world now, like, <laughs> like if you want like positive reinforcement, like, like don't go on Twitter. Like you're not getting like, <laughs> don't it's go not the place social you're gonna, media. <laughs> right. You're not going to get positive <laughs> affirmation there. Um, and so it's, it's, it's tough to keep your confidence and not be paralyzed by criticism or man, you just suck or he sucks. Yeah. And like, and, and sometimes, you know, again, like there's times like, you're right. I did suck. And I, I look back, I'm not one of those guys who are like, why did I get one of these big jobs when I was really young? I'm like, cause I wasn't good enough. And, and like, you've got to be able to be honest with yourself, have confidence, but also know, Hey, I got to get better. And while I want to be there right now, I may not be ready to be there right now. And if I was there, I probably wouldn't, take it, be able to take advantage of the opportunity enough. And so I've always felt like for me, like every step of the way that I, I didn't skip any of those steps and, and each, each step along the way prepared me for the next one. And, and I think that's a, I think that's harder for young people now sometimes that they're, they're like, you're not going to be at ESPN. Like, God bless you if you could be at ESPN at 23 or 24 or Yahoo, but those are places that took me into my mid thirties and, 40s to get to and that doesn't mean you failed it means you're you're it just means you're on your way yeah Yeah. see i just got when Woe just talking about the trust in the in the locker room man i'm just picturing i know how important that is to you to know like for for people to know how to just come up and talk to you you know even when they're not you know writing a story when the tape recorder's down you know no yeah that's a huge thing and and like the guys that i tell the most to are the guys that i consider to be friends you know what i'm saying and you can you can you can tell right off the bat, you know, as soon as I got in that Yankee clubhouse, you knew who was cool and who wasn't and, you know, who to, to keep the conversation short with and who you can talk to more. So yeah. it's just uh, – that that's a huge skill too in, in being a journalist is is knowing how to talk to to the athlete and, and having something yeah. in common 
other than just what's going on on the field or the court. Yeah, it's a little bit of a lost art. Like there used to be a lot more time that, that the access is a lot less, and I teams want to keep the media away from their players. But I I think it's a mistake in general because you are to me if you dehumanize your players and you you make it so that there's so little interaction with them and the people who they cover who cover them, it's a lot easier for people to just. Um, be more harsh or personal even at times in criticism because they said there's no like i'm never going to get to know that person anyway and when those relationships are there i think it benefits the players because i think all anybody who plays or coaches like you understand i think in general in almost every instance guys understand fair criticism i didn't play well there's going to be a level of criticism i'm pitching in new york and if i didn't pitch well i get there's going to be some criticism, but all I ask is that it's fair and you understand where I'm coming from. You understand something about me. And I think a little bit that's been lost through the years because there's more of a effort to keep everybody away from everyone. And I, I don't think it benefits either side, but, but that's the world we're in now. Yeah. C, C always has a line and we talk about like, it's hard to hate you when I see your face every day. Right. Like, I mean, yeah. there's, there's something to that, you know, like, Hey, Hey, hey listen, when I was at the Bergen record and I was covering the nets, um, along with, you know, other pro teams, like, Hey, if you wanted to say something about how Kenyon Martin was, play- <laughs> how Kenyon Martin was playing or what Kenyon, what happened with Kenyon Martin and Alonzo morning in a practice. Hey, guess what, man, you're walking in that locker room. And Kenyon's going to see you, and you're going to have to be accountable for that. And there's nothing better, like there's nothing better in our profession than to for you to be accountable for what you write or say. And so I've walked in all those locker rooms and clubs. Listen, like there's times you go, like I don't know if this guy is going to absolutely flip out and go off in front of everybody. <laughs> but, but you know what? Like, but but you've got to be there. You got to walk back in that head coach's office or that manager's office when you've written something tough about them and those guys are going to respect you. Now they might pull you aside. They might have, Hey, I want to get this off my chest and do it. And you go back and forth and you might agree to a disagree or whatever it is. But that to me was such an important part of, and I learned that working in New York when I went to the Bergen record and was in clubhouses, uh, in locker rooms and NFL. And, you know, you were covering, uh, covering those guys, you learned how to, be accountable for what you wrote and reported. We're in a little bit of a world now where a lot of the criticism and um, the shots come from people who don't ever have to walk in and face people yeah. and <laughs> be a tough guy um, when, when you don't have to then walk in and, and be face to face with them. And um, for me, it made me better like, because, because it's important to be accountable. Yeah. This is something uh, – we'll get you out of here in a minute, Walter. You've been so generous with your time, man. Yeah, this is great. Like, I love hearing the behind-the-scenes stuff for us. Like, it's it's great to just hear how it works. But this reminds me of something Mike Breen taught me when I was at Fordham, and we used to have uh, broadcasters come and do workshops. And Breen, one of the things he said – you know, he taught me a lot of stuff when I was in college and has continued to, but he said he has a rule. I will never say something on the air that I wouldn't feel comfortable saying to the player's face. And I like that because, see, you know, if I say if I if I'm doing a game and this happened from time to time, by the way, like C got shelled when I'm doing a game and I'm like, great. Now I'm, I'm the problem. <laughs> I, I'm the problem. And I'm like uh, and I'm like, you know, hey, CC, CC struggled today. Right. That's fair. And that's honest. And that's a word that he can accept. But if I you know, if if I mean, obviously, we have a different relationship, but if, if I'm saying like. Oh, CC was just dreadful today, and you have to wonder if he should make his next start. Well, okay, you know that's nothing I would ever say to his face. You know, even before he was jacked up like Kimbo Slice. You know, I mean, I, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, but right, see, I mean, there are certain no, words you can accept, and certain ones that are over yeah, the line. Well, it's not right? even accept. It's yeah. just like, just like uh, Woj said. You know, like you want to take criticism for a guy that you're gonna see every day, like a guy that knows your personality, a guy that knows that you're putting in the work, that you're working hard, that you can ask his teammates. But when it comes from somebody outside of, you know, kind of like the circle and the mm. people that you see every day in the clubhouse, it does, it, it, you know, it can get, it can get personal. 
and they don't ever they don't have to be held accountable for anything they say. So it gets annoying, to be honest. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah, and it's listen. Hey, it's it's if if you have any job that's in the public eye, to me, we signed up for it. You accept mm-hmm. it. I always say, like, if I don't like the if if there's some criticism that's irritating me, or I go, I don't really think that's fair, or you know, I'm trying not to pay attention to it, but I think I just like you know what. Like I'll say to myself, all right, if you don't like it, go back to Waterbury, go back to what you were making then, go back to the amount of people who read or saw your work, and then no one will bother you ever again. And I've got to, <laughs> yeah. I've got to tell myself that because it's like, it's not like tough shit. Like, yeah, yeah, you know, exactly, exactly. I mean, like nobody wants to hear it. Nobody wants yeah, to hear it. And yeah, sometimes yeah. criticism, I'm not saying it all doesn't have merit, um, but whatever, listen, that's, uh, we're all a product of sort of the environments we, we came up in and grew up in. And, um, you know, for, for me, it's been, um, uh, I, like, I've just been really lucky to get to do, I've never imagined doing anything else for a living. I just wanted to be a sports writer. I wanted to be able to be successful enough that I could support a family that I could be respected, that people had a level of respect for me. And that's what I saw as success. And, um, and so in that way, you know, I've been really, uh, really lucky, really lucky. Well, you checked all those boxes, man. And you, well, we, we may have to get you out of here before uh, CeCe finds out if Giannis is going to be a warrior. Because I, <laughs> I, know, I know that's on his mind. Yeah, he, he's, I've been hearing that. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's all of, see, this is what CeCe does, Adrian. He, he bounces from... Team to team, depending oh, yeah. on who. I bounce, I bounce from NBA team to NBA team. I'm such a diehard Raider fan, and I got to I got to cheer for oh, a Raider. Go. I mean, a winner in the in the in the, in the winter time. So I got to yeah. I got I got to cheer for a team that wins. Hey, so I, I, I hey guys, I, I look team to I, team. I look CC. I look forward to the time again where like that's the issue that I'm covering. Oh, like, right. what's Giannis going to do? <laughs> uh, what what's what's going to happen in free agency? Um, I think we're a ways away from that, but I we'll, we'll get back there eventually. Uh, I'm sure. We will. Sure. I'll leave you with this compliment, Woj. Uh, a few years ago, um, I was talking with a GM about you know certain goings on and and you know different things that you know people were writing about or reading about, and and he turned to me and he said, "Let me let me tell you something. The only time you ever believe anything you read is if it comes from Woj. Period." <laughs> and I have used that as a Bible for when I'm interpreting NBA stories. And I just thought it was a very nice compliment to the respect you've built within the basketball community and the knowledge that you uh, obviously have and continue to disseminate to all of us. So thank you. Uh, uh, no, that's uh, nice of you to say. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. <laughs> and, and thank you for giving us all this time. And this was such awesome insight and just some cool behind the scenes stuff. So we really appreciate it, Woj. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thanks, thanks, thanks for awesome. having me. That was a lot of fun. CC Ryan, uh, stay safe and, uh, Hope to see you guys somewhere in the gym here, somewhere in an arena here coming up. Definitely, definitely.